Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the PM services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, January the 28th. My name is Mark Syme. I'm the minister here at the Northfield Church of Christ. We will sing several songs, of observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message for you that I hope will be productive and edifying and enlightening. Here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. Uh, if you'd like to sing along with us, and don't have that book, I will give you the number and the name of the song, so perhaps you can find it in your book uh, and sing with us. The first song that we are going to sing in our book is number 422. The title is Spirit of the Living God. 422, Spirit of the Living God. <clears throat> Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Mold me, mold me. Fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, all fresh on thee. <clears throat> Our next song is number 523. 523, I know the Lord will find a way. I know the Lord will find a way. <clears throat> I know the Lord will find a way for me. I know the Lord will find a way for me. If I walk in heaven's light, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will find a way for me. The Lord has said, go preach the word to all the world. The Lord has said, Go preach the word to all the world. If I walk in heaven's light, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will find a way for me. Won't it be grand to hear him say, Well done. Won't it be grand to hear him say, Well done. If I walk in heaven's light, Shun the wrong and do the right, won't it be grand to hear him say, Well done. Before the Lord's Supper, we will sing number 763. O Master, let me walk with thee. 763. O Master, let me walk with thee. O oh, Master, let me walk with Thee In lowly paths of service free Tell me the secret, help me bear The strain of toil, the fret of Help me the slow of heart to move. My 
some clear winning word of love. Teach me the way what feet to stay and guide them in the homeward way. In hope that sends a shining ray far down the future's broadening way. In peace that only thou canst give with me, O Master, let me live. One of the things we are instructed to do on the first day of the week is to break bread, is to observe the Lord's Supper, which Jesus instituted on the night in which he was betrayed. He was in that upper room with his disciples, explaining them to them uh, what was going to happen. And when he did make that explanation, um, he set up what the Lord's Supper was really all about. It was about his body and about his blood. It was about the perfect sacrifice. It was about the entrance of a new covenant, a covenant in which the sacrifices of animals was no longer viable because Jesus would make the perfect sacrifice one time for all, for all mankind. For we understand that at the very right time, Jesus sent, uh, God sent Jesus into the world and he sent him into a sinful world that sinful man may obey him and that through his sacrifice and through his resurrection that we can come to have the hope of everlasting life. So as we look at the emblems, the bread representing his body and the fruit of the vine representing his blood, help us to understand the very significance of that and why it is so important to us. Let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we just can't even imagine the pain that Jesus underwent as those nails were driven into his hands and into his feet. We can't help but uh, comprehend uh, the physical sacrifice that Jesus made one time forever for each one of us. And so as we gather about his table, let's remember uh, that sacrifice. And as we partake of this bread, that we remember his body hanging on that cross. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. We understand, dear God, that it was necessary for Jesus to shed his innocent blood, the life-giving blood. We hearken back to uh, the days when the children of Israel were uh, in Egypt and the last of the plagues was them for them to put blood on the lampposts. And with that, the angel of death would pass over those houses. It is through uh, the blood of Jesus that the angel of death passes over us that we have the opportunity for eternal life and that we can have our sins forgiven. Help us to realize the magnitude of this as we partake of this symbol of his blood. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. Having completed the Lord's Supper as a matter of convenience, we now have the opportunity to give back to the Lord. And the amount that we are to give back to the Lord is stated in the scriptures. 
It says, give as you have prospered. It's up to us to understand and comprehend how much we have prospered. And I see the likeness between the Lord's Supper and giving, and that being that in Jesus hanging on the cross, he sacrificed himself. Our giving must be a sacrifice. Our giving must be reflected in what we sacrifice to give back to the Lord that uh, his word might be spread and the needy might be helped. Let's pray for our offering. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we have the opportunity to give. Help us, as the scriptures say, to be cheerful givers. Help us to understand that we are to give of our own, to sacrifice what we have, and to give according to how you have prospered us in the understanding that uh, what we give back to you is really your own. Bless us in our giving. Help us to understand the, the uh, magnitude of how important it is to give back to you. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The last song that we will sing is number 792. 792. My eyes are dry. 792. My eyes are dry. <clears throat> my eyes are dry. My faith is old. My heart is hard. My prayers are cold and I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. What can be done to an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. This completes our song service. Uh, I enjoyed praising our Lord. We praise our Lord because he deserves that praise for the, uh, just the things that he is, the things that he represents, and what he means to us as Christians. If you were uh, in attendance this morning at our AM services, you knew that uh, the title of my lesson was Truth Versus Culture. Truth Versus Culture. Often in our lives, uh, Truth is confronted by the culture in which we live. I would like to thank my brother Wayne Berger, a minister now in New Hampshire, uh, for the inspiration and the genesis of this lesson. We, we live in a culture. We know that we live in the world. And we live in a world that I think in many ways, is controlled by individualism. I hearken back into Old Testament days, in the days of the judges. In those days, the people were pretty confused. Uh, they wanted a, a king, even though they had a king and God, and that's what God wanted. And so uh, God wasn't ready to allow them to have a king. However, every time the children of Israel went astray, we find in Judges chapter 17, verse 6, and in 21 and 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. 
Unfortunately, in many ways, that is what our culture today, in today's world, is all about. They had a king in God, but they ignored him. They went about doing things that were right in their own eyes. Uh, these were some of the darkest years in the history of the children of Israel. And in many ways, they are dark in today's world. Even as wicked as some individuals are today in today's culture, they still, according to Genesis chapter 126, are created in the spiritual image of God. And in 1 John chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and in John 3, 16, we know that Jesus died for those people, those wicked people, as well as those who have come to know the Lord through the plan of salvation. So what did God do in his divine wisdom to try to combat this, to try to combat what the truth of God's word is against today's culture? Well, here's what he did. According to the Apostle Paul's writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3.15, he said that the church would be the pillar and support, get this, of the truth. And so today we have God's church on the earth. So how can we reach the culture with the gospel, with the good news of God? And because the church is the pillar and the support of the truth. The church, in many ways, in this culture, has been considered counterculture. A very, very uh, <laughs> hard to even explain it. A, a very, very wrongful understanding. Paul gave a great summary for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses uh, 3 through 6. He explained to us one of the ways that we can turn the world, today's culture, back to God. Here's what he wrote. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. God's obedience and God's and our understanding of God was complete when this Holy Spirit inspired word of God was complete. When we had the inspired word of God now, now we had the way and have the way to carry the truth to the world, to carry the truth to this culture and make sure that the world does not view us as counter culture. I have uh, put down three points as to how we are to do this. What our action is as individual Christians and as the church. First, we need to show the world, this culture, 
of the consequence of their worldview. Now, the worldview is much like that worldview of the children of Israel in the book of Judges, chapter 17. It said, in those days, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Now, everybody has a worldview, whether we're aware of it or we're not aware of it. And to the best, I believe, of our ability and to the best of uh, their willingness to listen, we need to help convey to this culture the consequence and consequences of their view. Immoral living, or even to the extent of amoral living, and that means having no standard, uh, this culture is one in which, unfortunately, we live. A, a culture in which man views himself as a law unto himself. That's why we have the violence. That's why we have the crime. This culture is filled with victims of this culture, of this crime and violence violence. It's, it's a culture of chaos. It's a culture of anarchy. And our job is to convey to the world that this is wrong. There is a moral standard by which we need to live. And we need to help them to understand, even using that, uh, that scripture from Judges, uh, the wickedness described there, and help them to see what's actually happening in our society today. You know, we, we look for consistency in our lives, don't we? In sports, athletes that are consistent in their performance are the ones that are viewed most positively. Literally every major sport has a Hall of Fame. And they just had an election of baseball, the Baseball Hall of Fame, just a couple of days ago. And the players that gain admittance into the Hall of Fame are those that have, have performed consistently throughout their careers. And so, second on my list of our actions is to show people in the world the inconsistency of their worldview. Basically, their worldview is that there are no absolutes. People did what was right in their own eyes. Why? They didn't see any absolutes. If they would see, had seen the absolutes of God and God's love, they would not be doing what was right in their own eyes. You know, our world works on absolutes. In, in the space industry, uh, it operates on absolutes. When a rocket is launched into space and it can hit moving targets, it can land on the moon, it can uh, meet other uh, satellites that are up there. These are absolutes. Why? Because the solar system operates on an absolute time schedule. If you don't believe that, this year is leap year. There is a February 29th. Why? Because in the earth revolving around the sun, it doesn't take 365 days. It takes about 365 days and about six hours. 
And so every fourth year, they add a day to compensate. It's called leap year. Why? Because they're absolutes. When we go and have a prescription filled by a pharmacist, do we want him to give us absolutely the medication that our doctor has prescribed? Huh, of course. And so the pharmacist works by absolutes. He puts exactly the right proportions of medicines in that prescription that we are going to take. Bankers work on an absolute system uh, when it comes to money. And so there are indeed all aspects of our lives in which absolutes are there. Unfortunately, except in our culture, where many people don't want absolutes. They want to be morally the way they want to be and religiously the way they want to be. These perhaps are the two areas that suffer the most. Finally, the third action that we take is to show the world the hopelessness of their worldview. I am here to tell you today the Christian life is the absolutely best life that we can possibly live. Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, he came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Christian worldview offers guidance, just as it did in the days of the Israelites when Jeremiah said, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it a man who walks to direct his steps. God revealed that to Jeremiah. These were the words that Jeremiah said to the people. And then in the New Testament, Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 1, 3. His divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the truth, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and his excellence. It is unfortunate for me to view that the world looks at us as Christians, the sinful people, that they look at Christianity as a burden. If I become a Christian, look at all the things I can't do. The things that they can't do are the things that they shouldn't do. We teach this to our children. It is taught in pulpits all around the world that people are to do what the truth of God's word says they ought to do. First John chapter five, verse three says his commandments are not burdensome. Jesus said, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is light. He said he will ease our burdens. With this, we have to explain to the world the hopelessness of their world view of immorality. Now, why is this so different? Because very often the world takes the view that offers no hope beyond this life, this life. The Christian view views Jesus' resurrection from the dead is part of our understanding that we will be resurrected from the dead one day, that we will live eternally with the Lord, that when we physically die, our souls live on, our spirits live on. 
Jesus said it so perfectly in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. To his disciples, he said, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe in me. That's the start. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And he predicted that he was going to leave the world. And he said, For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. What a soul-refreshing view. This is the view that we must take to the culture of the world, to the part of the world that is doing what is right in their own eyes, rather than seeing the absolute truth in the knowledge of God and his son who died for our sins. There's a second part to this lesson that I will share with you next time. And so how does this journey begin? It, it begins and we can only share this message with the world if we are children of God. If through hearing the word and believing it, we have taken it into our hearts. We have said to God, I don't want to live the way I used to live. And we repent of our sins, confessing Jesus as the Son of God. And finally, the last step is, is summarized in, in the Great Commission of Mark 16, 16, where he said, Go into all the world and preach the good news, baptizing them. And those that are baptized will be saved. That's the final step in our salvation. And then we become children of God. If you have that need this evening, get in touch with one of us. We are at your beck and call. Let's close with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the time that we've had together this evening. We're grateful that you are our God and Jesus is our Savior. Bless us as we live our lives. Help us to hold truth, hold true to the word of God. Help us that we understand Jesus' words, that you should know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That freedom is the freedom that's involved in the understanding that one day we will live with the Lord. Bless us in this life. Help us that we, with all our might, will live the Christian life we will take Jesus' yoke upon us because he is gentle and humble of heart. Continue to be with us. Continue to comfort us. Continue to bless us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all.